Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for tonight, Lord. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you speak to us through this Bible study, Lord, that you be glorified, Lord, that we would learn, we'd be taught your word, Father, that we'd be wise, Lord. Even if we look like fools to people in this world, Lord, help us to be wise in you, Lord. Help us to be filled with your love, to be loving, Father. And these days that we're living in, Lord, that we'd spread your gospel, Lord, that we would be, be able to show ourselves approved through the study of your word, Lord. Help us to study your word, love your word, be passionate about your word, that we read this, this be the main book that we read all the time, that we're not focused about reading any other book, reading this book primarily, because this is the one you wrote, Lord. This is the this is your love letter to us, Lord. And how can we love you and not read the letters you left behind for us to read for the rest of our lives, Lord? We love you, Holy Spirit. Teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to continue. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to pick up from where we left off. Reason why we're studying 1 and 2 Corinthians, because that's the letters that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and he's letting um, us know what God expects from us as Christians and how us as the church and the body of Christ, how we should be responding to the things that happen on this world, right? Because how many of us, we go through things and we're like, we don't know what to do about certain situations, how we should handle a lot of situations we're in was because a lot of us, we don't really read the word enough to really know what we should be doing in a lot of uh, situations. And God left us here uh, so we would know. So we're going to continue in um, chapter six, verse one. And this is from verse one to what verse is that? 11. Paul is talking about avoiding lawsuits with Christians. <laughs> Because how many know, as a Christian, according to the word of God, you should not be suing another Christian? And some will say, what? How could you How could you say that? I have to sue. I have to win money. I have to, they have to pay for what they did. And, and, and some people don't even know that here in the word of God, the word of God tells you, you should not be suing another Christian. It doesn't say don't sue a, a worldly person. But it says you should not be suing other Christians. Anybody want to take a guess why a Christian should not sue another Christian, even if they're right for suing them? Anybody know why? Want to take a guess why you think God doesn't want us suing another, having lawsuits with other Christians? Anybody know? Anybody want to take a guess? And don't go looking at the verses trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it can make you bitter. Leave it to God. Absolutely. Agreed. Those are good reasons. So we're going to find out now. Verse one, it says, when one of you has a dispute with another believer, it says, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? So first off, it tells you right there why. It says, because if you have an issue with another Christian, you should bring it before other Christians to settle it because why they will be able to righteously judge the situation. And why would you choose a worldly person who does not know God? And because they don't know God or his word, how could they righteously judge the matter amongst believers? <laughs> right? Imagine me as a pastor, I have another issue with another pastor and let's say I'm going to sue him or he's going to sue me. And we take it to a worldly judge who doesn't understand how church works, how God works, mercy, forgiveness, all these different things. You think the situation is going to get handled correctly? No. I should be able to find another pastor who knows the word of God and handle the situation. So Paul is saying here that as Christians, you should never file a lawsuit against another Christian. It's, and it's, and it, it says that it is like a, it's a, it's a bad thing. No, it, it say let Jesus judge and handle it. N no, that's not what it's saying. We're going to see here why. It says, don't you realize that someday we we believers will judge the world? I, we got to get rid of this language as Christians of saying oh, only God judge or let God judge. We have to stop saying that. It says here, verse 2, don't you realize that someday... We, who's we? 
we believers will judge the world. How many times do we hear people say, oh, don't judge. Oh, you're being judgmental. Oh, you shouldn't be judging. Oh, this and that. <laughs> How many have heard that for so long? And I think that I've said this so many times because people confuse judging with criticizing. As a Christian, you should not be criticizing people, but you should be making righteous judgment. And people say only God should judge me. You should be scared of saying that. You better hope that I judge you before God does. That is why God, as Christians, we should be judging so people can receive our judgment and turn away before they receive God's judgment and it's too late. Think about it. If you're waiting for God to judge you, that's when you're dead. And by the time, if you're waiting for them to, to realize if you're right or wrong, it's too late. So you realize how dumb that statement is? Oh, only God could judge me. Oh, I'm waiting for God to judge me. Okay, when you die and you're standing before the judge, it's too late. You're going to be sentenced. Why do you think you go to a lawyer first? A, a lawyer, what does a lawyer do? He lets you know where you're wrong and you're right. And I think Efren's on here tonight, so he, 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 I know he can agree with me. Um, You go to a lawyer, the lawyer will tell you, hey, this is where you messed up. You broke the law here. This is this. The judge is going to do this to you because you did this wrong. So they will let you know the lawyer will give you his judgment before you deal with the judge's judgment, which is a lot scarier. But if you're like, oh, nobody judge me, nobody tell me, then the lawyer can't tell you nothing. But by the time you go to court and you present your case, that's it. You're, you're going to get what you're going to get. So better to deal with the judgment of the lawyer who can tell you how to fix things, change what you're doing, change what you're going to say. So you're ready the day that you face the judge, you're ready to go. How many can say amen? So us as Christians, we are like those lawyers. We're letting people know, don't do that. This is not right. You should, you should turn away from this. Oh, but you're judging me. Yes, I am judging you according to the word of God before the final judge gets a hold of you. And if the final judge gets a hold of you in that condition, it's over for you. So, yes, I'm judging you. And, 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 and so, oh, but you're judging because you hate me. No, I do because I love you. <laughs> Christina said, yep, that's why lawyers prepare their clients before they go to trial. Exactly. So that is why we're here. We're like people's lawyers. We're here to tell them, hey, listen, man, you shouldn't say that. You better take that back. You better turn away from your doing because I know this judge. <laughs> How many lawyers, if you talk to, you deal with a lawyer, they know judges already. Hey, I know this judge. If you do it, if you come the way you are, he's going to lock you up. He's going to put you away. So they'll prep you and get you ready. So why? So you're ready to deal with the final judgment. So us as Christians, when people say, oh, you guys are judgmental. Absolutely. Because I'm preparing you for the final judgment. I'm preparing you so you'll be ready to deal with the judge on the last day. Because on that day, there's no more I'm sorry. There's no more God forgive me. It is going to be that's it. I have all the proof. I have all the evidence I need. Let's deal with it. So we have to stop saying as Christians, oh, don't judge. Let God judge. It says here, don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? Did it say that God will judge the world? It said we believers will judge the world. And it says, and since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourself? So God's expectation is as a Christian, you shouldn't be suing another Christian because he's saying, if you're going to be in charge of so many things in the heavenlies and you want God to put you in all these places, how come you can't handle little situations with other Christians? Isn't that crazy? You meet a lot of Christians who have expecting God to do all these amazing things for them. And God's like, you can't even handle your beef with family members and friends and, and other Christians. You don't even know how to deal with them, but you expect God to put you in charge of many things. You want God to, to put you in leadership. You want God to make you a minister. You want God to do all these things. You don't even know how to deal with other people who are in the same faith, the same belief system. Come on, somebody. You, 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 the same person that serves the same God, the same Jesus. If you can't deal with them, you won't be able to deal with anything else. And it says here, don't you realize 
that you will even judge the angels? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It says you'll judge the world. As, as believers, we're going to judge the world. And it says, don't you realize that we will judge angels? Anybody know, oh, what do you mean judge angels? Because when you die and you come to the new earth and the new heaven, you are going to rule over them. You will be above the angels. You're going to rule over them. A lot of y'all didn't know that. So, once again, is the word of God telling us not to judge? Is the word of God saying, let God judge? Only God should be the judge? No, God is the final judge. But, like I said, we're the lawyers on earth. Yes, we're bringing judgment. And the Bible says, guess what? <laughs> Yes, and Christina's right. He's just, he's just telling us how to judge. And then how do we know how to judge? According to the law, according to the rules, according to the person. Because why? What is a lawyer? Why is a lawyer be able to help you with that? Because the lawyer is the one who knows the law. They're the ones who studied it. They're the one who got a, a degree. So they know how to deal with the situation. They know the ins and the outs. And, and, and we don't. So that's why they'll be able to to be able to deal it, deal with it. So we need to prep people before they deal with the final judge. And if they get offended by it, they get offended by it. Let them get offended. Offense should cause you to change the right way. See, people who get offended, they change in two different ways. They'll get changed in the sense of bitterness, anger, pride, or 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 they get offended and it changes. So this is, it's so important. This is so important. This is so, so important because, it, it, and the thing is, and see, Ephraim said that he only tells them possible scenarios. See, but the thing about the word of God is the scenarios are not possible scenarios. They're guaranteed. See, as a lawyer here on earth, we don't know everything that's going to happen. So that's why we you, you're going to tell them possible scenarios. But guess what? We know the guaranteed the guaranteed scenario. If you sin, the wages of sin, the word of God says it's death. See, on earth, hey, you did this. I don't know if you're going to get five years, 10 years, probation. I don't know, but I know the consequences won't be so good. So you do your best to be, but, but even better, us as spiritual people, we know the guaranteed scenario. If we know the word of God says no fornicators, no adulterers, no thieves, no liars, the revilers, and all these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not a possible scenario. That is a guaranteed scenario if you don't turn away. So if you tell that to somebody and they take it as, oh, my gosh, you hate me. Imagine that you you hire a lawyer, ask the lawyer, hey, what do you think is going to happen? You think I'm going to get locked up? You think I'm wrong? And they start telling you the truth and you're like, oh, well, that, my lawyer hates me. Does that make sense? If you did something wrong and you hire a lawyer and he's telling you what the consequences you may get. <laughs> you may get for what you did And you start saying my lawyer hates me Does that not sound immature and stupid It shows that you're like What how, how do I hate you You asked me You hired me <laughs> If you care about my case you'd tell me the truth Right So And it says here So you should surely be able to resort, resolve Ordinary disputes in this life if you have legal disputes about such matter, why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I am saying this to shame you. So God is saying here, if you're a Christian hiring lawyers to sue another Christian, it says shame on you. It shows you're not spiritual enough to deal with this. And some would say, but, but I'm entitled to money. I'm entitled to this. And they should learn and pay for what they did. And God, look what God's going to say here. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, it says one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. So another God is saying, if you sue another believer in front of unbelievers, it says you are taking a loss, <laughs> a big L. And it says, why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that why not let yourselves be cheated instead you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat and even your fellow believers so what is god saying if they did you wrong if they did an injustice what is he saying you should do 
accept it. But no, you know why you won't just accept it? Because of pride. Pride makes you not let things go. Pride makes you, when somebody hurts you, offends you, say something back to you, you hold on to it. And then now you're resentful, you're bitter, you're angry, you always have an attitude and stuff. And that's why God says, you should be able to trust God and let it go. Oh, but they crashed into my car. Let it go. Oh, but I lost money. Don't you trust that God will provide? Let him deal with it. And it says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive. You know, abusive, right? I first agree, but if a person is the the person needs a Lord to obtain resources to compensate for future medical financial ramifications from someone who's negative, but the person is Christian. That's your opinion, brother, but that's not what the word of God says. So we need to stick with the word of God. We're, we need to stick with the word of God, not what we think, what we feel, because the minute you start doing what you think, what you feel, God's not in the midst of it. And the problem with a lot of Christians is if we start uh, start changing the word of God to fit our, our situation, then God's word is not complete and it's not it's not sufficient for us. If, 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 if it was going to be about anything else, God would have left it in his word. And God said it here. It is a shame. It, did God's word, guys, did God's word not make it clear in here that it is a shame? It is a shame if you sue another Christian. And if you're worried about money and if you're worried about this and all these different things, then you don't trust God. How many here have you ever had an injustice happen to you and you did everything you could to fix it and you still didn't get what you wanted from it? You still didn't get what you thought you was going to get from it. Say um, yes, revilers, yes, are abusers. Same thing. See, see, and, and that's why it's so important as Christians. See, I don't, I don't need someone else's money. God will take care of me. God will take care of me. And we start, no, but I need the person to pay for this or pay for that. Well, okay. shame on you. And that's not Jamie saying this. This is the word of God. If you're worried about money, I, it, if you're worried about suing somebody because of money, I can guarantee you, you have issues with money on other issues of your life. I can 100% guarantee you, if you're trying to sue somebody because of financial ramifications, I can guarantee you that you have other financial issues in your life because money should never dictate why or what, what we don't do. Right. If it's like, no, because I need them to pay my, my medical bill. I need them to do this. Then you have bitterness and resentment that you don't let go. You don't trust God enough that God will take care of your bills. You don't trust him enough. What do you think? God's going to clean his hands and say, well, I, I can't help you financially because they were supposed to pay for it. So I'm not going to. You think you guys believe that God works like that? Oh, I, I, they crashed into you. And my words tells tells I told you in my word to let it go, but I didn't know that you needed the money. I didn't know I'm not going to provide for you. You think God works like that? Why would God tell you to do something, you do it, and then you're the one who gets screwed at the end? Does that make any sense? God tells you to forgive somebody, and it ends up doing damage to you and hurts you and destroys you and ruins you, and now you're homeless. You got no money because you listened to the word of God. See, this is why we live in a Christianity where people cannot accept the full word of God. They don't trust God enough. I, listen, I've been through a lot of things in my life, and I've seen how God has always come through. How many have had situations in their life where people did you wrong and they never took ownership of it? How many here have the people have hurt you, done you wrong, used you, abused you, never took ownership for it, never took responsibility for it. They never paid for it, but God still took care of you. God still took care of you. There's been times my vehicle's been crashed into and, and stuff like that. And, 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 I didn't get paid by the person who crashed into my vehicle and different stuff. And God has taken care of it because I'm not looking for people to take care of me. I'm not looking for people to pay. I'm looking for my heavenly father to take care of me. If you want to take another Christian to court for money, shame on you. Shame on you.
And shame on you. Why? Because the word of God says it. Guys, am I saying anything that I'm making up? Am I saying anything that I just made up? Did I just make that up? Is this is this Pastor Jamie putting his input? Or am I not saying what the word of God just said? Because I want to make this clear because people well, sometimes don't, oh, I don't agree with this. You, you, you don't have a disagreement with me. You have a disagreement with the word of God. Because if it's Jamie, if it, Jamie outside of Christ, I tell you, sue the person and get every last penny you can get. If I wasn't in Christ, but I'm in Christ, I'm not in the world. If you think like the world, you'll respond like the world. That's what the world does. Oh, I'm going to make you pay. And so if you think about, oh, well, you did this to me and I'm going to make you pay. Well, the Bible says don't pay evil with evil. So if they did evil to me and I'm trying to do evil back by getting money from. So it goes to show you. You're not really in Christ. Justin said it happened to me with the next that was. Wicked, she owed me money, and I had text proof she would pay me back. So biblically, I could have sued her and been correct. I thought about it, but decided to just let it go and still had another financial thing come through that gave me back much more than what I lost. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You see that? He let it go, and God provided. When you're like, I won't let this go, they need to pay for this, I guarantee you, you have money issues, you have forgiveness issues, and all these different things. <laughs> Ever said, remember, attorneys don't sue people. People sue people. That's why I'm saying this to people, not attorneys. If you're an attorney, that's up to you if you want to be the middleman. But as a person, as a Christian, you should not be suing. You should not be suing another, another Christian. Now, if you hired an attorney, that's his job, and he's... And he helps you get, get the other person sued. That's a different story. But as you as a Christian, you should not be suing another Christian. If it's about money, you should trust God that he'll protect, he'll provide for you. If it's about making them learn their lesson, God will make sure that they learn their lesson. If you take matters into your own hands, you're gonna, it's going to be shame on you. That's why I said, how many times in life has anyone ever had gone through something where you're trying to make a person learn their lesson, right? Because they did something wrong to you or whatever. And you're like, I'm going to make them learn their lesson. I'm going to make them pay. I'm going to make them, you know, and it, it causes you more problems. It'll cause you, it always will cause you more problems. Ah, oh, man. Oh, they did this to me. I'm going to make sure they learn. I'm going to make sure they, they pay for this. It's, and, and I love that you said, it never satisfied. It's never enough. It will never be enough. So that's why you have to let things go. It, you got to let things go. And it says here, verse 11, some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on his name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So <laughs> I love that Paul reminds us, hey, you used to be like this. See, I, I had a conversation with somebody recently that said some things that really angered me about God. And I got angry and God told me, Jamie, you better let it go. And I said, why? He said, you've said worse things in the past. Before you were in Christ, when you, even when you were a baby Christian, you said worse things. Just because you, you've grown a lot now doesn't mean you got the right to act like that. You better remember where you come from. And I think a lot of Christians, we forget where we come from. We're so quick to overly criticize and put the hammer down on somebody. And you forget you did that at one point. You forget you used to do the same thing. You forget you used to be lost at one point. That is why you should have mercy and compassion on people. You should have mercy and compassion for people <coughs> because of a lot of things. I'm going to give you an example about, I love that Ephraim brought it up about the whole, you know, situation. I, I, I remember somebody hit my, my vehicle once and I got so mad. It was my, my black truck for you guys. My, I call her black beauty. I was so mad. They banged, they banged up my truck and guess, guess who, guess who scratched my truck? The church that comes in after our church were in the location we are in. They scratched my truck on my driver's side 
really bad. My wife would tell you, I got so mad because that's when we had just got the truck. And I said, I'm going to make those people pay, especially that they're Christian. How could they scratch my truck outside the church and not even have the courtesy to tell me, hey, hey, pastor, sorry, like I scratched your truck pretty bad. Like here's at least a hundred bucks to try to, I don't know, get your truck fixed. They didn't do that. And I remember I was so upset. I was like, how could it, how could you come to church, scratch someone else's, hit somebody else's vehicle, and then don't say nothing and just play dumb? How many here can honestly be upset? <laughs> Especially that my truck's black. You can see every mark. I, I got upset. I said, how could you do that at a church parking lot and not say nothing? And it was the church that came in after us. I got upset. And what was I thinking? I'm going to make them pay. I was going to hire Efren to make them pay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, and I remember God said, let it go. God said, let it go. And yeah, amen to you. I was like, I work so hard for my stuff and it, it's bad. And I, I let it go. But check this out. I have never crashed into nobody prior to that ever 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 uh about a couple weeks after or a month after a couple months after that i was in my other vehicle my older vehicle that i drive around you know, that i don't really care too much about i don't know what happened that i had left a chick-fil-a drive through i don't wasn't paying attention and i guess i thought i had my foot on the gas and i side swiped the back of some some woman's car and I, I kind of dented it in it and I scratched it. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> and 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 I said, God, please have mercy on me. Isn't that crazy? We want God to show us mercy, but we don't like to show people mercy. Imagine that. You want to take somebody to court, but you would wish if you were the one who did wrong, you would want them not to take you to court. <laughs> and I remember. I smell the chicken, Joe. <laughs> and uh, I remember I got out the car. I said, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I I scraped your car like that. I said, if you want, you can have my Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I was like, I'm so I felt I said, you want to call the, you know, want to call the cops, want to, you know, make a police report. And she looked at her car and I and and it was scratched up and banged up. And she said, you know what? I'm sick of this car anyways. Don't worry about it. She was like, I just, whatever, who cares? It's in the back. I don't even look at it anyways. Got back in her car and left. If you show mercy, God will show you mercy. If you show mercy to other people, mercy. And as she left, I called my wife. I was like, babe, I don't know why, but I just crashed into somebody. Getting Chick-fil-A. And <laughs> she was like, were you eating when you were driving? I said, no, I don't know what happened. I literally don't know what happened that I, and it's so funny. I, I created the same marks on her car that was made on my truck. The same probably was her husband's car. And, and um, I created the same marks, the same exact marks that I had on mine, that was done on mine's. See, if you show mercy, God to other people, that's why it's so important. If they're a believer in Christ, just let it go. Let it go. Money, God will bring it back to you. Whatever. It, you reap what you sow. I had another scenario once. One time, I had a wrong delivery delivered to my house. I don't know whose it was. It was a big box. And how many here have ever had your, your, your package stolen or gone to the wrong address and those people kept it? Has anyone ever had, especially with Amazon Prime, has anyone had that situation happen now? And you know what grinds my gears? It's like these people open your box and they keep it. It's like you don't even know what's in there. It could be a medicine. It could be baby diapers. You don't even have baby. And you, now you just keep it because you you know you shouldn't have opened somebody's box. And I had a, I got a huge package delivered to my door. <laughs> Ever said exact thing happened to him. The other guy was also crazy. He said, "Be careful, and God bless you." My fault. 
Hey man, I had to deliver myself the right address, Sally. My food delivery, I was heated and hungry. <laughs> so I had this big box. I'm not going to lie to you. I was a bit tempted. I was like, man, it's a big box and it's heavy. It's got to be something good in there. <laughs> but I looked at the address and I said, you know what? I'm going to take it to my, I'm going to take it myself. I went, knocked on the door and I delivered that package to the right address. I didn't have to do all that, but I went and I did that because it's the right thing to do. And I told my wife, I'm going to do it because I order a lot of things. And one day I would like for somebody to do that for me if they get my package. Well, sure enough, a month later, I had bought a bunch of parts for my rifle. Um, <laughs> I almost said it. And he looks for an excuse to uh, to damage the car or body injury, especially when you're rear-ended. Yeah, it's true. Um, And uh, so anyways, uh, a month later, um, I had ordered really expensive parts for a rifle of mine and uh, it got delivered to the wrong address. And there's no worse thing when you get that text message says your package has been delivered. You open the door and there's nothing there. There you really find out how, how good of a Christian you are. There is when you really find out if you trust God or not. I was so mad. I opened the door and I'm like, this is not delivered. And I even like went down the hallway, you know, checked the hallway down. I was checking everyone's doorstep, nothing. And I told my wife, I said, I'm so mad. These are expensive parts. If somebody keeps that, they're a jerk. Because these are very specific parts to a rifle that if you don't know what that is, you won't know what you just kept things that are expensive. And um, and, and, and it, it was I was like, man, you know what? And, and then I, I remember I left. I was upset and I let it go. And I told my wife, I said, I have a feeling that whoever has my package. They're going to bring it back to me. And I said, because a month ago, I returned somebody else's package. So I believe I'm going to reap what I sowed. Well, sure enough, as I was on the phone with my wife, my wife goes, hold on. There's somebody here at the door. Let me call you back. I, she calls back two minutes later and she goes, the guy, complete different neighborhood, came and delivered the parts. It was accidentally delivered to his door and he felt like he needed to return it to us. I reaped what I sowed. So if a month prior, <laughs> I would have kept that other package, I'm sure my package, I would have never got it. So that's why it's so important, guys, as Christians, we're not vengeful. We're not looking for revenge. We're not looking for people to pay. We're not looking for people to learn their lesson or we're supposed to let things go. We're supposed to forgive. Right. Because this happened to me one time. I got guys. I have so many stories. <laughs> I had one time I ordered food on DoorDash. And, you know, the little jerk from DoorDash put delivered, I guess, to show that his delivery times were quick, but he didn't deliver it yet. So when I looked outside, it wasn't delivered. So I put not delivered and they they refunded me. But what he was doing was he was marking it delivered early, but still delivering it later, just so it showed on the app that he was doing it quick. So I had put... um not not delivered and <laughs> door dash drama and so i put not delivered i got a full refund and then five minutes later i hear somebody at my door and it's him delivering the food and i was like oh man i was like he shouldn't have been you know submitting that he delivered it earlier than when he did because then no one's really going to know when they get so it's things like that man we just got to learn to do the right thing as christians so what did i do i contacted DoorDash and said hey don't give me no refund. I got I got the order. If you start keeping stuff like that and, and being like that, you watch how God is not going to bless you and things start to happen to you. Anyways, let's continue. Enough DoorDash stories, enough suing stories. <laughs> Amen. Let's keep going. Uh, verse 12. Ever said that's why I do a lot of pro bono cases for people with no reason. Even when I needed the money, God is great. The feeling of gratitude in my own heart is worth more than money. Amen. It's the best feeling in the world when you do things because out of the kindness of your heart. So God bless our brother Efren. Verse 12, you say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. That verse right there is powerful. 
Look what it says here. I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. This is so important for us as Christians because a lot of times us as Christians, God, we're allowed to do things, but just because you're allowed to do something, it does not mean that God necessarily wants you to do that. How many can say amen? Because a lot of the times we're like, well, I can do this. I can do that. And then blah, blah, blah. And God, so you got the permissible will of God, and then you have the perfect will of God. I don't want to be in the permissible will of God. I want to be in God's perfect will. I'm going to give you an example. God told Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a child. But what did Abraham and Sarah do? Abraham went and slept with somebody else to make the prophet the prophecy happen. And because of it, they paid the price for it. God permitted it, but it wasn't his perfect will. So it's so important as Christians that we are not looking for things we can get away with. We should be looking to do what God wants done in our lives. God, is this what you want or is this what I want, hoping that you will stamp your okay on it? Because what happens is a lot of times is we, because we're allowed to do things and God permits us to get into relationships. He permits you to be here, do this, do that. We automatically think that God gave his green light because he, he permitted it. But we have to understand that we need to start maturing as Christians to say, God, I'm not trying to find out what I'm permitted to do. I want to do what you want me to do. How many could say amen? Because a lot of times we do what we're permitted to do. Okay, you you can go on a date if you want. You want to go be with them? You want to go do this? You want to go do that? God's like, okay, go for it. How many have, How many times have any of you guys on here, we go for things and do things, and God's like, don't do it, but hey, if you want to go do it, go do it, and we go do it anyways. And then we, we pay the consequence for our sin, and then we're crying out to God, God, why is this happening to me? God, why did you let this happen to me? And God's like, well... You know, you went after my permissible will and not my perfect will. The perfect will is harder. A lot of us, we try to avoid the perfect will of God because in the perfect will of God, you have to be patient. In the perfect will of God, you have to let go. In the perfect will of God, you have to forgive. In the perfect will of God, it'll mold your character. In the perfect will of God, <laughs> in the perfect will of God, you don't see all the answers. But we we go the permissible route. I, I'm going to do what I want, what I, what, what seems to be easier. See, God's perfect will, it looks a lot different than our will. And we got to learn to stop doing that because guess what? When you start chasing after the permissible will, you end up becoming a slave to that thing. If you start pursuing things that you feel like you're allowed to do, you become a slave to it. You know, I mean, I know Christians will be like, well, I, I committed this sin and they, they keep doing that sin. And I said, well, you know what? Well, God will keep forgiving me. Well, well, then you'll keep being a slave to it if that's your mindset. How many have ever battled with a sin and you've convinced yourself like, well, God will just forgive me for this. And then you keep doing, you keep doing like, well, God will forgive me. That's why he died for me. And then guess what happens? Now you're a slave to this thing. So when you keep pursuing the same sin and you keep giving yourself a pat on the back. I know guys, I've been in Christ long enough. I gave my life to the Lord when I was, I was 19. So guess what? When I was 19, I was still sinning. Even when I came to Christ, I was battling with a lot of things. And what would I do? I'd encourage myself. Oh, it's okay, Jamie. You're young. You're going to make mistakes. You're, you're not perfect. You're human. God will just keep forgiving you. And what happens is you make yourself a slave. You justify in your mind, it's okay to be a slave. I'm here to tell you, stop justifying your sin. Stop justifying your condition and saying, well, it's okay to be this way. It's okay to be depressed. It's okay to keep watching pornography. It's okay because God will keep forgiving. I'm here to tell you, it's not okay because God did not make you to, to be a slave of sin. The, if anything, the Bible says to be the master over sin. See, as Christians, we need to start learning to be a master and not a slave. Come on, somebody tonight. And that's not just for sin. This is just and everything in your life. You should become a master of it. You know why a lot of times we don't get put in the positions of master? Because you have not gotten out of the slave mentality. You have not got out of the slave habits. You, you still act and think like a slave. But once 
You start defeating things. You pass the test. You prove that you can become a master. God gave Joseph a prophetic word. He says, you will be the ruler over your brothers. You're going to rule over this entire territory. But guess what? What's the first thing God did to him? Made him a slave. See, I'm here to tell you, and I feel the Holy Spirit so strong. God will sometimes tell you things and do the very opposite thing right after it. Why? Because he says, I need you to beat some things so you become so good at it that you, you can rightfully earn and deserve to become a master of it. You don't become a master right away. You don't become a master never messing up. You don't become a master of something being perfect. You have to go through things. So you say, I'm a master of this. I failed, but I got back up. I messed up, but I got cleaned up. I, I, I came up short, but the Lord came through and I became a master of this thing. I used to be afraid of this thing, but I became a master over this thing. I used to be have filled with fear, but now I'm a master of faith in this area. I used to be, oh, come on, man. I used to get controlled by these emotions. I used to get controlled by these thoughts, but now I control these thoughts. I control these emotions. These things don't, don't have no hold on me. See, demons used to control me. Now I control demons and I send them to hell. They don't send me to hell. So we got to go and become a master. How many could say tonight, God is making me a master. But before you become a master, you got to be a slave first. A slave of what? A slave of Jesus Christ. But you can't. So think about it. You, you're either a slave. <laughs> you got two ranks. You have a slave to sin, but Christ comes, saves you. Now you're a slave of Jesus Christ. But God eventually brings you in to be a master. I want to be a master over this thing. How does somebody become a master of something in, in, the, in the world of something? You want to become a master, uh, I don't know, hairdresser? You're going to have to cut a lot of hair. You're going to have to work at jobs you don't want to be at. You're going to have to cut people's hair that... Maybe their hair texture is not good. I don't know anything about hair like that, by the way. <laughs> Maybe their hair texture is not good. Maybe they're, you, you, you cut somebody's hair who has bald patches and you don't know how to fix. You, you would deal with a lot of uncomfortable situations, uncomfortable scenarios. You're going to have to deal with different kinds of people and things. It, because if you have only the easy ones, if you only have only the good ones, you're not really a master. Come on, somebody. If all you deal with is the good and the easy, you're not a master of anything. You, you become a master of something by dealing with the difficult and beating it. Oh, oh you, 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 you lost to it yesterday? I'm going to beat you today. Becoming a master is not doing something right one time. It's being able to do it right many times. That's when you know you're a master. Because some of you be like, but this has happened to me before, Lord, and I dealt with it well. And God said, yes, you dealt with it well one time. But can you deal with it well? Multiple times when you can. I feel I feel this is ministering to a lot of you on here tonight. See, you've gone through things and you're like, God, why am I going through this again, Lord? I already went through this before and I did the right thing. And God said, I know. But if you're going to become a master of this, you got to go through this multiple times to prove that you are really a master. Because how many, how many you go through, how many have ever been sick before? You got a health scare. You go through it, you pass it, you grow your faith. And then another sickness wants to come on your door. You're freaking out. That shows you're still a slave to this thing. And God is like, I have to put you through this again so you can become its master. And that thing doesn't become your master. Because when something is your master, it controls you. It dictates your emotions. It dictates your thoughts. It dictates how you think and how you feel and how you move and what you do. But when you're the master... You're the one doing the dictating. You have to dictate and say, hey, I've been through this before. 
I'm going to beat you again. Oh, financial hardship, I'll beat you again. Issues in the marriage, I'll beat you again. Oh, I'm single again, I'll defeat you again. <clears throat> How many of you have gone through things and you've got you've made it out, but you're you you're terrified of possibly one day having to go through that again. How many could be honest? Be like, oof, I don't know if I want to go through that again. But if you're a master at something, you're not afraid of dealing with it again. Think about that. If you 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 mastered it, you stop being afraid. I remember when I when I when I used to box, when I used to box, there used to be this guy who had more experience than me. And when me and him used to spar, he used to beat me. I remember we had sparred and I, I was I recently just turned pro and he had been a pro undefeated for a long time. We sparred and he beat me up. And I was like, man, this guy beat me up. I don't know if I want to spar him again. You know, then I finally sparred him one day. And I prepared myself in the gym and I beat him up and I beat him up real bad. And I remember the next week they were asking me to spar him again. And I got nervous and I said, why am I getting nervous? I beat him last time. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, it was Wilson. And, and, um, and I said, why am I getting nervous? I beat him last time, but you know why I got nervous? Because I won some and I lost some <laughs> before. And I knew I hadn't mastered it yet. I just had gotten a victory, but I really didn't master it. And when we sparred again, it was a little bit more difficult. So I kept sparring and sparring until the point that I had beat him so many times. I just, every time, I, they, oh, you're going to spar Wilson. This guy's name was Wilson. You're going to spar Wilson? It makes me think of Castaway Wilson. And I would spar him. And every time I'd spar him, I wouldn't even think about it. I wasn't even nervous, nothing. I was like, I already mastered this guy. And I would beat him every time we sparred. So think about it. If you know you've mastered something, you're not afraid of it no more. When you know you've mastered something, you're patient. When you've mastered something, you don't get negative thoughts about it no more. When you're a master of it, if you know God's putting you through it again, you're like, let's go. Let's get it. <laughs> Amen. You don't have to worry about it. Oh, I'm scared. I'm going to, I'm going to fall in sin. I'm going to, no, I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid to confront things. I'm a master. I'm a master. <laughs> Let's keep going. And it says, you say food was made for the stomach and st stomach for the food. This is true. Someday God will do away with both of them, but you can't, you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Oof, think about that. Your body parts are parts of the body of Christ. That is why you got to honor God with your body. And it says here, and don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scripture, the scripture says two are united into one, but the person who is joined in the Lord is one spirit with them. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. You know how people say all sin is the same? Is, does that verse agree with that statement that all sin is the same? What do you guys think? No. It says run from it. This says no other sin clearly affects the body like this one does. And it says you be why? Because when you sleep with somebody, you join your soul with them. And this is what you call a soul tie. That is why if you're anyone on here, you have slept with anyone before marriage. You need to break the soul tie. Oh, but I love him. I don't care. Break the soul tie. It's not of God. That is not God's order. That's not God's way of doing things. That is why you can't stop thinking about your ex. I, I ain't get a lot of amens there. That's why you can't stop thinking about your ex. That's why you miss your ex. That's why you compare the next to your ex. That's why you can't even be happy with the guy or the woman God wants to bring to you because you still compare them to your ex. And you have a soul tie. 
and you got to get set free from it. See, God, God, God preserved your body for your spouse one day. But God's not bringing you a husband or a wife. Meanwhile, you still got soul ties to somebody else. Because guess what? That man is God's son. That woman is God's daughter. And God's not giving his son or his daughter to somebody that's still connected to somebody else. You got to break every soul tie. How do you know you have a soul tie to somebody? You slept with them. Did you repent? Did you renounce? And if you know you don't have nothing to do it, when you think about it, doesn't do anything, has no effect. And I know some people say, well, I don't think about them. I don't have no feelings. I've met people who've, who've been married for years and I don't think about them. But the minute you bring them up or they come around, they get angry. They get bitter. They get they get all they start acting weird. <laughs> That goes to show me you still got feelings. You still have a soul tie. Oh, but I haven't called them in years, brother. I haven't talked to them in a long time. I don't even. Well, are you casually looking them up on Facebook or Instagram? Uh, you may still have a soul tie. If they mention their name or if they come around or if they're at an event you're at and you start acting weird, you may just still have a soul tie. You got to break free from it. Amen. Because if not, you become a slave to it. And it says here, run from sexual sin. Oh, I already read that. And it says here, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? See, a lot of the times, and I blame a lot of the YouTube Christianity, you're so worried about what you're going to do, giving you a demon. But how, how come you don't worry about how it makes the Holy Spirit feel inside? I'm here to tell you, if you focused solely on how you make the Holy Spirit feel in you, you wouldn't worry about demons coming in you. See, you have a you have a group of Christians always worried about a demon coming in them. If you focused on the Holy Spirit, there would be no demon in you. But because you're always worried about a demon coming in you or a demon this, a demon that, a demon that, a demon coming in. And, and guess what? That is why you get demons in you. The Bible says your thoughts run your life. If every time you do something, oh, I'm scared to do this because I'm going to get a demon. Well, Guess what? You're going to get a demon. Just, even if you don't do that thing that would have gotten you a demon, you're going to get a demon because of how you think about demons. You should be thinking, does this please God? Instead of thinking, is this going to get me a demon? Because, see, you, that, that shows you're not trying to live for God. You're trying to see what you can get away with with God. <laughs> you need to be consciously thinking about the Holy Ghost. Say, Holy Spirit, does this please you? Holy Spirit, is this is this holy? Is this righteous what I'm about to do? Instead of saying, oh man, I'm worried if I do this, I get that, I'm going to get a demon. Yeah, you're going to get a demon. But if you were focused on the Holy Spirit, you won't get no demon. Because if you had the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't even be thinking about those things. It's non-negotiable. <laughs> it's non-negotiable. Oh, you want me to go to the club? It's non-negotiable. I ain't going. Oh, you want me to hang out with worldly friends? Non-negotiable. Not because I'm worried about a demon. I'm, I'm worried about my God, my Savior, the one I'm in a relationship with, the one that I'm in love with, my lover, the lover of my soul, my Lord, my Savior. I'm worried about him. I ain't worried about no demon. I'm worried about God, about pleasing him, about how it's going to make him feel. And if I live a life focused on how I make God feel, I ain't worried about how I make demons feel. Because if it's worried about, I'm here to make the devil's life miserable. And the only way you make the devil's life miserable is living a life for him. And guys, I we cast out demons at our church. I, I, how many? How many have been in our church long? We see you see we we cast out demons, but I'm not demon conscious. There's people always talking about demon, demon, demon. You're gonna get a demon if you do it. You're gonna get a demon. You're gonna yes, you will get a demon, but. If you focus more on the Holy Spirit, what will you? You're gonna get the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Catch the Holy Spirit instead of worry about catching demons. Catch the Holy Spirit in you. Be so filled of the Holy Spirit. There's no room for demons. That's how we gotta become. A demon tries to look for you. Oh man, there's no space in there. It's tight in there. And excuse my terminology, but I want demons to come find me and say, oh, that's Mexican packed in there. There's too many people. I, I, there's too much Holy Spirit in there. There's no space for me. <laughs> it's so tight packed with the Holy Spirit that there's there's no there's no room. There's no room. Amen. You guys want to do one more chapter? Are you guys ready to go to bed? Want to do more? One more? Let's take a vote. Let's take a vote. 
and don't and don't put don't put more because everyone else is putting more. Uh, somebody putting. Oh man, I want to go to sleep, but more. <laughs> All right, let's do one more. <laughs> Jason, no more. I'm still at work. Then get off. Now this is going to talk about marriage and some of people, Oh, but I'm not married. You need to know about marriage before you get married. Think, think about this. I know people, when they talk about marriage at church, ah, uh, I don't I remember when I was, before I was married and they talked about marriage at church, I would immediately check out. I'm like, I'm not married. So this ain't for me. But if you paid attention about, and you knew about marriage, you'll, you know what it is and you'll be ready for it. Because guess what? Marriage is a contract. Once you sign it, you better know all the fine print. You better know all the ins and out. Because uh, how many people got married and they're like, I didn't know I was supposed to do this. I didn't know I'm supposed to act like this. I didn't know I wasn't allowed to do that. And you're like, uh, so you better know. <laughs> you better know God's expectation in marriage. Amen. So this is what this chapter is about. Verse one, it says, now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, so those of you are on here, you're married. Maybe some of you on here, your marriage has ended, been divorced. Maybe you're single. You want to get married again. So this is for everybody. It says here, now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but there is so much sexual immorality. Each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. <laughs> Efren said it's called terms and conditions in the contract. Yep. You better learn the terms and conditions because <laughs> once you sign it, it can't get out. And someone said, yeah, but I can get a divorce. <clears throat> but talk to some lawyers. Some lawyers will tell you it's not in your best interest to get a divorce. You're going to lose everything. A woman's going to take, you know, she's going to take everything from you. <laughs> uh, so he says here that it's not good right? It's not good. It says that you, you're by yourself. Why? Because we're human. God understands you have, you know, physical desires. And he's saying here, you should have your own wife. Keyword, your own wife, not somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband, right? You should have your own. And it says here, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority over to his uh, of his body to his wife. News flash. Husband, your wife, your body don't belong to you. It belongs to her. And and wife, your body does not belong to you no more. It belongs to your husband. So I'm like, oh no, no, my body's mine. It's or so I even heard some super spiritual. No, it's not my husband. My body belongs to the Lord. That's not what the scripture says here. If you got married to him, it says here that you're supposed to fulfill his needs and his needs. I mean, her needs you as a man, you should be able, it says you should fulfill it. Verse three says the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. Notice that it said needs, not wants. I'm going to say that again. You notice that it said needs, not wants. Because what happens is in a lot of marriages, and I've seen it in Christian Christian marriages, what if your husband and your wife has perverted desires? And is that scripture telling you to fulfill their perverted desires? No. Because it's not a need, it's a want. That's why you think what you want. There's a lot of things you should not be doing in marriage. You should not be having anal sex in marriage. That's not of God. You should not be doing that. And you should not be watching pornography in your, in your marriage. I know people in marriages that do stuff like that, and they think that that stuff is okay. I ain't get a whole lot of amens. <laughs> Shouldn't be doing that stuff. Oh, but pastor, I thought we're allowed to do whatever we want. No, you're not. Because what happens is you'll start exploring things you should not be exploring. You, you, And the only reason why you desire to do those things or want to do those things is because you saw that in some 
adult video before Christ. And now you think that you want to do that in marriage and think that it's okay. I know people who do stuff like that. There's and, and it's in marriages. The guy wants to, you know, do a certain type of sex. Like I said, like anal sex or something like that. And the woman's like, no, I, that's not in it. You're defiling your marriage. You're defiling your wife. You're defiling your husband. You're starting bringing things in there. And guys, I'm not kidding you. I've met people that do those things and they, their marriage ends later on at some point. Or they find out that their spouse is so addicted to pornography, so addicted to lust, so addicted to perversion. They've gone so far to the point they start doing things that are not natural and not normal and they don't know where they went wrong. Yeah, it's true. Christina said, you think you get to fulfill your fantasies and it's wrong. You don't get to fulfill your fantasies in marriage. I know some Christians disagree with that. <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> That's why they're perverted. It'll never be enough because the only reason why you want to practice that on your wife or your husband is because you saw that. I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you this. Did you learn that from the Lord? Did you learn that from the word of God, that act that you want to do in marriage? Or did you learn that from the world? Did you learn that from the perversion of this world? And now you want to implement it in your marriage. That's why you are defiling the bed of marriage. You shouldn't be doing those things. And if you feel like your quote unquote, your sex life in marriage is boring, uh, you probably got to get delivered. You probably have a lust problem and a perverted spirit and you got to get delivered from it. So you don't do that in your marriage. That's why you're not supposed to be sleeping with people before marriage because you experienced a very perverted sin. And now when you meet somebody and they don't want to do it, they won't do it like the last, there's that comparison now. And now your marriage feels boring. Your wife feels boring. Your husband feels like it's not satisfying you because why you're comparing it to some other type of perversion that is not of God. You see, that's why God tells you, you shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> you should be pure. You should walk in holiness. You should walk righteously. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. Because that's why I said, I meet people who will struggle with pornography and masturbation. They get married. They think marriage is going to heal that. Marriage exposes you. It won't heal your issue. Marriage will not deliver your problem. It will actually expose it. And, and then if your marriage doesn't expose it, then when you have children, your children will eventually expose your issue. How do I know that? Because then you start watching your kid follow in your footsteps and you're like, I don't want my kid doing that. But why are they doing that? Are you doing that? And if you're doing that, <laughs> you're a father. And you're still watching pornography, but then you get upset that you find your kid doing something he shouldn't be doing in his room. Well, guess what? It's because you're doing it. You invited that spirit into the house, man. Come on, somebody. And you invited that spirit and they just are dealing with the consequences of you inviting these spirits into your home. That's why you got to live pure. Even being a married person, you better live pure. Just because you're married does not mean you're pure. And, and Paul talks about it here. He said, afterward, you should, it says here, uh, do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourself more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come back together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So he's saying, if you're married, uh, it's, he does not recommend that you should like abstain from having re sexual relations with your spouse. If you're married, you should be having that. If you're abstaining from it, you're going to give room for Satan. And if you've been married, you, you, you know, you know that that's true. If you start depriving each other, somebody's going to cheat. Somebody's going to get curious about somebody else and you're going to give room for the devil. So the Bible says, don't give no room. Don't be doing that. Stay together, figure out how you can make this work. And, and so you can, if you are going to do that, it's because you're, you're doing it for some kind of spiritual reason to get closer to God. And it says, uh, 
I say this to you as a concession, not as a command. This is for the single people. It says, but I wish everyone were single just as I am. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And I know some people out here are single. You're like, what? I rebuke this verse. This isn't for me. <laughs> he says here, I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. Brother, I can't believe you. How could you read that verse? Are you prophesying to me? I'm going to stay by myself? No. <laughs> Paul is just saying, you, whatever condition you find yourself in, don't fight to get out of that condition. Learn to become full and whole in whatever condition God has allowed you to be in. And it says here, so I say to those who are not married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better than to burn with lust. But for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him. I've noticed that a lot of people, once they get a divorce, the first thing they're thinking about is, am I going to be by myself or should I find somebody else? What does the scripture say? What does the scripture say here? Anybody know? You just read it. Justin got it right. Remain and, and so did Christina. It says remain single or else be reconciled. Does that mean you can never be with nobody ever again? No. There's a reason why he's recommending that you stay by yourself. Because as I notice, especially here in America, people have a codependency issue. They cannot stay by themselves. They get depressed going to a movie theater by themselves. They get depressed around Valentine's Day. Think about this. How are we filled with the Holy Spirit and love with God? And on Valentine's Day, you get depressed. You get you get depressed around Christmas because you're not exchanging gifts with somebody. You should change your perspective. <laughs> you should look at it. It's Christmas. I buy myself a gift. I don't got to buy no bozo a gift. <laughs> oh, it's Valentine's Day. I don't have to be over here wasting time with somebody that it's not my husband or my wife. You should take advantage because us married people, <laughs> we got to come up with a lot of ideas and a lot of things every single year. So and take advantage that you're single and focus on you. Right. And it, and it says here, but if you're going to leave your husband, it says stay single. Why? Because you need to heal. You need to get delivered. You need to get built back up. And you need to focus on the Lord. If you end something with somebody and all you're thinking about is being with somebody or if you're going to ever find somebody again, it shows you have a codependency issue. And that is why I notice people who have those codependency issues have multiple failed relationships in their life. None of them ever work out. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't fix that issue, yes, you'll find someone else again and then you'll lose them again. And it'll keep failing again, again, and again. Because that shows that you having somebody in your life is your God. I know people that 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 the minute they get with somebody, it's their God. If they're by themselves, it, it dominates them. And it says here, and the husband must not leave his wife. <laughs> so men, you're not allowed to leave your wife. And it says here, now I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not have a direct command from the Lord. So I love that Paul makes this clear. He's about to tell you something, but he's saying it's not a command from God. So people, when you read the word of God, you better know your Bible well. That's why the Bible says study to show yourself approved. Is this. There's things in the word of God. There are requirements and then there's recommendations. And how do you know which one is which? He makes it clear. He says, now I will speak to the rest of you. I, though I do not have a direct command from the Lord. It says, if a fellow believer has a wife 
who is not a believer and she's willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Have you noticed that people who are always <clears throat> married to somebody who's not in the Lord, they're waiting for them to get saved to bring holiness into the marriage? That's not what this, that's not what the verse says. You're the saved one. You should be bringing holiness into the marriage, even if they're not holy. Oh, but they're not in the, you should be bringing it. You shouldn't be waiting for them to get saved to make the marriage holy. And this is for people who got saved after being married to somebody that wasn't saved. If you're saved and you're looking to be with somebody who's not saved, you're unequally yoked. This verse is not, is not applicable to you. And it says here, <clears throat> yes, both marriage should be equally yoked. So this verse is not, it's not talking about that. It's talking about somebody. Let's say, for example, you were married to somebody. You both were not in Christ. You accepted Jesus. And now you're the only one in Christ and they weren't. You just happen to have gotten married before you got saved. So it's speaking about a situation like that. It's not talking about a person who's saved and then goes, looks to be married with somebody who's not saved. That's called being unequally yoked. And it says here, and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. But if the, so look at that, look how crazy that is. So you're worried about maybe the spouse not being saved, but if you're holy, you're bringing holiness to your children. But I'll tell you this much. If the unholy spouse is bringing unholiness to your children, I got a question. Is your holiness that holy? Mm. If you're holy and your spouse is unholy, your holiness should make your children holy because your holiness is more powerful than the unholiness of the other one. But if the unholiness of that spouse makes your kids unholy, then I'm here to tell you, your holiness is not that holy. It says, but if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leave, leaving, let them go. I have so many people ask me all the time, oh, brother, you know, such and such person, I'm married and they want to leave. You know, they, they packed their stuff. They moved out. Goodbye. Let them go. If the relationship is done, it's done. And people say, oh, but I thought we're not supposed to get divorced. I'm here to tell you the biggest lie of condemnation that the church gives you. You're never allowed to get divorced. They better read your Bible. That's not true. You're allowed divorce only in the in two circumstances. Well, two circumstances. Infidelity, the person did something and cheated on you, and you're not able to forgive, even though God recommends for you to try to work it out and forgive. But it says, if you're not able to, you have the right to end the marriage. But it says, when you end the marriage, don't go looking to go get married with somebody else. If you ended a marriage to, and then you ended up with somebody else after the marriage, it gives signs that infidelity with that person wasn't the issue. You were never satisfied in that marriage. That's why if you ended a marriage and ended up single after it shows that you were the person that was correct. But if you ended a marriage and right away you're in another relationship, it shows you both were wrong and you both become adulterers. That's why. And then the person who dates you becomes an adulterer as well. That's why it's so scary. But it says here, and in the other case is this, if the person wants to leave, you're married and the person's like, I'm done. I don't want to be with you. Um, and it's over. The scripture says there, it says, what does it say here? What did we just read? What does it say? Let them go. And it says, in such cases, <laughs> Josh screws it, bye. It says, let them, in such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other, for God has called you to live in peace. Don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? Don't you husbands realize that your wives, keyword, might. There's some people who will stay in abusive marriages, marriages that has no peace because 
oh, he might be saved. There is no guarantee that they'll be saved. Because it says here, might. It says, each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. So what is it telling you to do? Go and try to find somebody to be with? We're in a, like I said, we're in a generation, especially with the youth, always trying to find, I'm trying to find the one, I'm trying to do this. That's not what the scripture is telling you to do. You should be so in love and so focused with God. If some, if God brings somebody to you, it, 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 it's going to be so clear and evident. <laughs> you don't have to be fighting and doing all this stuff that you're doing. And it says here, this is my rule for all the churches. For instance, a man who was circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it. And the man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not be circumcised now. For it makes no difference whether a, a man or not has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. So he's saying, if you were single before, stay single. And if the opportunity presents itself that God brings you somebody, then you take it. But you shouldn't go looking for it. And it says, and remember, if you were a slave when God, the Lord called you and you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you and you are now a slave of Christ, God paid a high price for you. So don't be a slave enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. Now, regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married. How many young women we got on here? Some of you are going to justify and say, I'm old. I'm older just so this, this doesn't apply to you. <laughs> it says here, I do not have a command for the Lord for them, but the Lord in his mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted and I will share it with you. Because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it is not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have trouble. And I'm trying to spare you those problems. <laughs> Look at the Apostle Paul. He never got married. And he's telling you, you shouldn't be trying to be so quick to be getting married. Why? Because you need to become so in love with God that if God brings you a man or a woman, it's the cherry on top. It's not the whole cake. God is the whole cake. You should be so satisfied and in love with God. He's the cake. And if God brings you somebody, they're just the cherry on top. If you, you feel like you have no cake because you don't have nobody, then you have relationship idolatry. And it says here, the time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy of their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world, as we know it, will soon pass away. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. So how do you know if God wants you to be with somebody or if this is, it says here that it will help you serve the Lord better. So if God brings you somebody and you're single, you got to ask yourself, how do you know if this person is from God? Will this person help me be better at serving the Lord than when I was single? If you get with somebody and you become worse at serving the Lord, when they come into your life, that's not a good sign. And it says, and with as few distractions as possible, if they come into your life and yeah, you're still serving God, but they're a distraction, 
they can possibly be not the one or maybe you're allowing them to become maybe not necessarily always that they're not the one, but maybe you're creating them into into something that in a way that it shouldn't be. And you got to slow your roll and slow it down. And she says, but if a man thinks that he's treating his fiance improperly and will inevitably, you notice it said fiance. So if you're not a, a husband or wife and you're single, there's no such thing as boyfriend, girlfriend. Give me one verse. Give me one that mentions boyfriend or girlfriend. There is none. If you're single, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to courtship, get to know the person as a friend. There's no kissy, touchy, changing your Facebook status to control them and check their phone, make sure no one talks to them. That's manipulative, it's demonic, and it's not of God. You're supposed to get to know them. And if, if you want to be with them and God says they're the one, get a ring and, and propose to them and get engaged. Cause they say it's here. And then, cause the only thing you should be is either a brother or sister in Christ, then fiance, then husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend is a fake covenant. It's not a real covenant. It's not of God does not honor boyfriend, girlfriend relationships. That's, that's not a real thing. That's a worldly thing. And it says here, uh, it says, but if a man thinks that he's treating his fiance, Keyword, fiance, improperly and will inevitably given to his passion. Let him marry her as he wishes. It is not a sin. But if he has decided firmly not to marry and there is no urgency and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who marries his fiance does well. And the person who doesn't marry does even better. <laughs> it says a wife is bound to her husband. As long as he lives. Why Why does Paul keep talking like that? You notice that Paul keeps kind of like giving you the kind of like, hey, man, don't do this. It's because he's showing you, man, you better take your time because this is forever. You better take your time. Think about So I know some people try to rush to get married, rush to find somebody. Why are you trying to rush? This is for the rest of your life. This is for the rest of your life. You try to go hurry up and find somebody hurry up and get married. That's going to be for the rest of your life. So you better take your time. Better be oh, and that doesn't mean be some be somebody's boyfriend and girlfriend for a long time. If somebody wants to be with you and they say they're from God, they should be putting a ring on your finger and trying to marry you. Oh, but we don't have the money for a wedding. We don't have this. Then fine, but you you still be a fiance. That will make sure you ain't going nowhere. You want to worry if the person is going to go anywhere, then they should they should be a person of commitment and covenant. But you notice they don't want they don't want commitment. <laughs> they don't want covenant because they want to be able to leave when they don't like something. And that goes to show they're not ready for marriage because they don't want commitment. Because if you notice with marriage, you don't get to quit when you don't like something. When my wife eats my cake that I put in the fridge that I was kind of hiding from me and she's, I don't get to end the marriage. I don't get to, you know, end the marriage because uh, I don't get to, you know, do this or do that. No marriage. You, your marriage becomes pleasing your spouse. If you get into marriage for them to please you, you're not ready for marriage. I know, I know people will say, Oh, uh, well, you don't do this that I don't like. I don't like that. You talk like this. I don't, I don't like that. You like this to me. I wish you dressed like this. I wish you were like that. You're not ready for marriage. You're not ready for marriage. Marriage is not about them pleasing you. Marriage is about you pleasing them because marriage is a servanthood. I know people are like, oh, I don't, I don't want to be with them because they don't cook for me. They don't clean and they don't do this for me and they don't do that. And the Bible says where there is self-seeking, you find all kinds of evil there. And that shows you're an evil person because when you're in marriage, marriage is about you trying to do everything you can to make that person happy and pleasing them. <laughs> my wife said it best, outserve each other. Do you know that me and my wife, we don't argue. <laughs> when we do argue, you want to know what we argue about? Who's going to wash the dishes? Not the way that you think. I told my wife, babe, I'm washing the dishes. She's like, no, I'm washing it. 
And she was on my wife. She was like, because you were at work today. I said, no, I want to wash the dishes because you were with the kids today. And we will argue with each other because all we think about is how we can serve each other and make each other's life easier. That's what marriage is. If it's looking at like, well, I washed yesterday. It's your turn. That goes to show you're selfish. <laughs> rock, paper, scissors. Hey, the only thing me and my wife rock, paper, scissors is the diapers. I The diapers, that's just the... I can't negotiate those things. I got a weak stomach and I can't deal with the smell. And especially my toddler, man, when you, the baby diapers, I could deal with those. Don't, don't smell bad. Them toddler diapers, man, my toddler, man, his diaper smells like a grown man. Those are different. So I wish Paul would have put that here in Corinthians, I, you know, put it here, except the diapers, you know, those you should rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> And my wife said, I go through a pack of wipes. Man, every man does. I don't know how some of you women, you guys can clean a, a kid with just two two wipes and conserve the whole pack. I have to use the whole pack to clean my kid, man. Because <laughs> I want to make sure none of that gets on my hands. Anyways, let's keep going. Uh, let's see, where was I left? Uh, okay, almost done. 39. A wife is bound to her, her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. Keyword, you should only be marrying somebody who loves the Lord. And it says, but in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And I think I'm giving you counsel from God's spirit when I say this. Amen. We'll stop it right there. <laughs>